Welcome to Dave Talks Comics. I'm Dave. This is my program, my podcast, where I talk about comic books, cartoons, and comic book conventions. And this is episode 171. All past episodes can be streamed or downloaded from the program's website, davetalkscomics.com. In addition to the program's website, this website, this website, this podcast can be found in all the usual places where you'd find podcasts like iTunes or Apple Podcasts or Stitcher and other places like those. You can find my notes on what I have read at davetalkscomics.net. I'm going to be talking about some books that I bought, not stuff that I read this time around. So I don't think there's going to be too much in the way of spoilers, but it's possible that there will be a spoiler or two somewhere in there. And I'm back, except I never recorded anything before. I guess you could say I'm back from since January. It's my first recording in February of 2020. Probably This probably will be the only episode I record in February 2020. I went to another show, another local show. I left... It's uh, today's February second, Groundhog's Day. It's also Super Bowl Sunday, but I'm not really interested in the Super Bowl. I was kind of browsing online today. I was looking at a couple things, looking for a couple things. I've been reading the what is it, the uh, Terry and the Pirates, the comic strip from the ninth, which began in the in the mid 1930s, and I think it ran up until like the 70s. But the collections I have just collect the stuff that Milton Kniff did, which was basically from late 1934 to the end of 1946. Yes, I believe that's correct. Although I still need to buy the final volume of that. I have the first five volumes, and I'm still working my way through the first volume. But at this point, I'm about three-quarters of the way through it, and it's it's finally starting to get really good. Although, as I write in my notes, I think I prefer the... Pat Ryan part of the strip over the Terry and the Pirates part of the strip. It's Pat Ryan and his, let's see, how should you put it, his romantic adventures or his romances, the romances of Pat Ryan. But I guess they were trying to appeal to little kids, so they didn't call it that. And I don't don't know how much it would have appealed to other people in that way. Anyhow, I was looking into this because I was also kind of interested in the the comic strip that followed it that Milton Kniff did after it, which was Steve Canyon. He did that for over 40 years, and I can remember reading that in the newspaper in the early to mid-1980s. I believe it ran until 1988, until about the time that he died. I think there was like a, a, a small backlog left over after he died, and then once all the strips he did were had been published, that was it. But one thing, so I was looking for more information on those online today, this morning when I woke up. And what I was able to find was that there was a couple books that are, there's one called the the Steve Canyon Companion, and another one called the Terry and the Pirates Companion. But these were very limited print runs. They're kind of hard to find. I did find, uh, I mean, when I went looking for this, I think it was the Steve Canyon one, I found it online at Amazon. There's only one person selling it at Amazon, and they want $200 for it. I did find another copy on on eBay, which I think I can get for about $22. It's being sold with like a Mad Magazine and something else, Iron Horse, an issue of Iron Horse or something like that. But I'm thinking about buying those. But I figured since I was planning on coming to the show today, I wouldn't bother to... To, to buy them until I had seen if I, you know, just by chance, you know, you can never tell. You might run across something. But like I said, they're rare. And the Terry and the Pirates volume I found for about the same price, about $22, I think, including shipping. It's by itself. It's a little a little beat up. It's got some stains in it, but it looks more or less intact. And I'm kind of interested in seeing what that is. And this is done by somebody who was a big fan of of Terry and the Pirates, and I guess of Milton Kniff stuff in general, if he did both books on Terry and the Pirates and Steve Canyon, basically, what, like 50 years' worth of 
of, of comic strips drawn by Milton Kniff from 1934 to 1988. Yeah, that'd be about 54 years worth of comic strips. And he was a member, I don't know if, he might have even been the founder of a, I, I found a little bit about a fan group of Kniff, what was it called? Kniff, Kniffites? Yeah, I think that's what it, it is, Kniffites. And they had a newsletter. I found a copy of a newsletter online for sale for, I don't know, $20 or something like that. It, it was the only reference that I could find to this, which once again just reinforces the fact that the Internet is great for searching for some things. It's not great for searching for everything. But part of what got me interested in looking for this, for more information about Steve Canyon, was the fact that I was able to find a a list of all of the arcs from Terry and the Pirates in on Wikipedia. Somebody had added them to Wikipedia. And actually, now that I think about it, I'm wondering if that came from the, the, the Terry and the Pirates companion. Because I was able to find a web page, although the page had been taken down, but I was able to find a copy of it on the Internet Archive, which lists all the arcs from, not Terry and the Pirates, but uh, Steve Canyon. Uh, there's over 180 of them, I believe, if I if I remember correctly, and there was no information as to how long the arcs were. There were just the names of the arcs. There's been about t- 10 volumes so far of the Steve Canyon archives published at this point. I, you know, those things cost about fifty dollars a piece new. Some of them are actually out of print already. I'm kind of interested in reading that, but you know, at the same time. <laughs> I'm only about a year and a half, maybe a little more than a year and a half, into reading the 12 years worth, or a little over 12 years worth, of of Terry and the Pirates comic strips, which, by my calculation, there's got to be more than 40, uh, probably about 44, 4,500 strips. I, I didn't do the math on how many... I must have read at this point, but it's certainly less than two years worth. It's at best about probably a year and eight months worth, something like that. It's a little wonky right now because the daily strips and the Sunday strips are... I'm I'm almost up to the point where they are running together, but at the point I'm at, they're presented separately in the book. And so while I've read up to like late August in the Sundays, I'm only up to early June in the in the dailies. And but in both cases, that's 1936. So even once I finish off 36, I'll still have 10 years worth of Terry and the Pirates to read. So I, my point being, I don't really need to be buying these collections of Steve Canyon. I actually have an old reprint of Steve Canyon, one of the, uh, I think it was the Checker Books Publishing's reprints of Steve Canyon that reprints the first year's worth, I believe, of Steve Canyon, 1947. But it's all in black and white. I believe there's nothing in color. Though I don't know the, I, I would have assumed, considering that he was running it basically starting with, I mean, right after, um, Right after Terry and the Pirates, he probably did the same thing as he did with Terry and the Pirates with dailies and then also Sundays, and he probably ran them all together, but I don't really remember, and I I have to pull that down off the shelf to see if... Anyhow, that's what got me thinking. That was one of the things that's been on my mind today, and one of the things that I wanted to talk about, one of the things, the things I wanted to look at and look for online or look for at this show that I went to today. So I drove up here to Columbia, Maryland to a show at a, I think Clandestine is the name of the company that does it. And it was a, a, not a huge room at a, uh, you know, a ballroom in a, at a hotel, not, probably not a ballroom. It's just a, a meeting room at a hotel. And it, you know, it's kind of packed. It was kind of, uh, crowded. Not all the dealers had stuff that I was interested in, meaning they didn't have dollar boxes or relatively inexpensive boxes. I started off by going through some boxes at a dealer who, a dealer, uh, I think who, who runs the show. And I found four things in his box, 
his boxes that interested me. Uh, the first thing, let's see, what was the first thing? I think the first thing I found, I was, he didn't have any dollar boxes. He had some $3 boxes. And I found that it, sometimes it, it makes sense to look through those. And I actually ended up paying a little less than $3. I don't remember if that was the deal. Maybe it was. Maybe it was. I think it was $3 a piece or 4 for $10, because that's what I ended up paying for the four books I bought from him. The first one was an old issue of Uncanny X-Men that I used to have, number 156, which uh, on the cover says, Enter the Star Jammers. And this is the one which, of course, uh, I think Corsair had been in the previous. It's the one that opens with what looks like the death of Colossus. It's drawn by by uh, Dave Cockrum and... Who was doing the inks at this time? Was it Rubenstein? Cockrum? No, Wyacek. Wyacek on the inks. And I used to have... I had this... I got this originally in my subscription to to Uncanny X-Men back in the early 1980s. Let's see. This issue is from April of 82? Yes, April of 82. That makes it contemporary with some of the issues of Captain America and Spider-Woman that I've been reading recently. I also found, I wasn't, I wasn't really finding stuff that, I, I mean, I was seeing stuff that kind of caught my eye, but nothing that really, really appealed to me. But I did find something that's been on my list for a little while, for a few years now, and that's one of these anniversary issues from around 1983-84, and this is the Superman number 400. And I've seen this advertised. It's not in perfect shape, but I've seen comics in worse shape. It's probably uh, probably very good or fine minus, something like that. I mean, the cover's a little beat up. It's not way beat up. It's just a little beat up. But I, I picked it up anyway because it's, it's one of those anniversary issues. And I'd like to have them all if I can. I can't remember what the complete list is of those off the top of my head. And then the other things I got was the first two volumes of the reprints of, well, not that one, the first two volumes of the Dead Man reprint series from 1985. And these are, these were print, reprint everything, I think, all the early, um, all the early Dead Man stories, but of course the the highlight from those, I think, is the Neil Adams work, but Neil Adams was not the first artist to work on Dead Man. It says, let's see, Carmine Infantino. Yeah, probably Carmine Infantino was the first one to draw him, but I'm not sure. I did a few years, several years, uh, a few years back, I picked up the trade paperback collection of the Dead Man reprints. So I probably have all these stories already in there, but my issue with that, I just really don't like the paper that that's printed on. If I'd known it was printed on that paper, I wouldn't have have picked it up. I bought that at the same time that I bought the first collection of the New Teen Titans, and I am now I have now read through volume six of that, and I have yet to really read any of the Dead Man uh, stories at all. But now that I have these reprints, maybe I will. Probably in these reprint books, and the other thing that's kind of nice is that the reprint books these reprint books also have more than just the the dead man stories they usually have sometimes they have text pieces and sometimes they have some other stories done by Neil Adams or other people and they have all new covers by Neil Adams I think the stories might be recolored um I'm not sure about that I know with the the green lantern green arrow series they had been recolored but I think they're very nice looking and he didn't have all seven issues of this reprint series. He did have the first two, and I think he had one or two later on, but he didn't have three or four. It might have been like five or something like that. So I paid $10 for those four issues. And then I walked around a little more. There wasn't a whole lot of space to walk around. There were some boxes, some tables I wanted to stop at, but there was people all in front, and these were tables that had like dollar boxes, that kind of stuff. I did eventually find some dollar boxes, and I found a couple issue of Who's Who that I didn't have already. I have the complete run of the original run of Who's Who, and this is part of my kind of interest in collecting all these reference books, as I like to call them. Who's Who, the official handbook of the Marvel Universe, and so on and so forth. 
So what I found was issue four of the 87 update and issue four of the 88 update. I didn't have either one of those. And at some point I should probably pull these out because I think it's kind of fun to compare the entries from one run and another run and how information changes and how things change. And then the other things that I got was the uh, some issues of the Ohatmu, the official handbook of the Marvel Universe, the deluxe edition. I have the complete run of the original edition, all 15 issues. I'm not sure how long this run of the deluxe edition ran for, but I found issues 16, 17, 19, and 9. And 16, 17, and 19 are all part of the Book of the Dead deluxe edition. 9 looks like it's from Molecule Man to Owl. And that looks like a John Byrne cover. Yes, North Star's on there, Moon Knight, Nightcrawler. Who else do I recognize? Frankie Nova, or maybe she was just Nova at this point. And it's got a backing, so I can't see who's on the back of the on the back cover. So that's basically everything I got. I think I spent a little over twenty dollars, including it was five dollars to get in. See, so yeah, then I spent ten dollars on those first four books. And then I spent about another $6.25 because one of the dealers charged me tax. So I think I spent $21.25 for 10 books. Yeah, I think 10 books. So that's not a uh, uh, an amazingly great price, but uh, I managed to restrain myself from buying anything that I wasn't uh, really interested in. And I bought a bunch. I bought some stuff that I was interested in getting, even if I. And bringing my, bringing my my tablet, my iPad, loaded with my inventory on it was very helpful because it 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 kept me from buying a couple things that I already have. And um, and I need to update. I I also have a spreadsheet where I I keep a list of comic books that I want to buy, but I found that by cross checking between that, and the list of comics that I have, that there's some stuff on the list of comics that I want that I already have. So it looks like I need to do a little maintenance on that list. So I think that's going to be it for right now. I, I don't know the next time I'm going to go to one of these shows. I've made a list of shows, these small shows that are happening throughout the year. The first big con I'm planning to go to is Heroes Con, and that's not for another what, three, four and a half months, something like that. So I might go to another one of these small shows or two over the course of the year. I, I don't feel like I really uh, need to buy anything. I have plenty of stuff to read. I'm constantly looking and finding new stuff to read. But I really just, I just need to work on reading through the stuff I've, I've got or enjoy reading the stuff I've got. It shouldn't be a chore. Although I do make it into something of a a job, the way I write up these things and then add them to my blog about about uh, about what I've been reading, and uh, I'm I'm about a week behind and stuff. I'm I'm about ready to take a break from Captain America. I finish off this small run of Spider Woman that I bought at the last show I went to issues. 42 to 44, which was a story that involved the Viper. And I was interested in that because the Viper had just appeared in the Captain America story I just read recently, and there were actually references to the Spider-Woman story. And Spider-Woman showed up in that story very briefly, and it was, it was weird because it was like they had intended her to be part of the story, and then it was all of a sudden she just dropped out of the story. And she went from having four pages in one issue to having two panels in the next one. And I really wonder what happened, or who, if anybody, could give me a straight answer about that. Or if there's anything about it in one of the fan magazines from that time. Or if I can find anything online in somebody's blog, somebody who knows something about this. So that's what I'm reading, and I'm getting back into Black Hammer. I'm working on the second half of the library edition of Black Hammer. And so those are the two big things that I'm reading right now. My The next thing I want to get into after is I want to read the the Judas Contract is the next thing in these Teen Titans collections that's coming up. I want to read that next. 
Um, I realized that I have three issues of Kazar that I want to read. These are the issues, Kazar the Savage, the series that started, I believe, in 1981. That uh, With these three issues, this is the story that introduced Belasco, the demon, the one who's probably best known for kidnapping Ileana Rasputin, who later became magic. And I was thinking maybe after I read that three-parter, maybe I'll read the... Uh, the issue of X-Men that introduces... Uh, well, it doesn't introduce Ileana, and it doesn't introduce Belasco. That's true. Ileana, I think, had shown up way back in X-Men... Either X-Men 94 or giant-sized X-Men number one. Belasco, of course, had first shown up in Kazar. There was this weird thing back then where they were just... There was, like, demons showing up all over the place. There's demons showing up in, in Spider-Woman. There's demons showing up in Kazar. I don't know, I guess it was maybe the flavor of the day or something like that. It was just something that everybody was interested in. It, I don't know, it, it doesn't make a, a lot of sense to me, but it, yeah, I mean, it really threw me for a twist. I actually had to go back and reread part of that, of issue 44, when this demon shows up of Spider-Woman, and it turns out the Viper is somehow working for this demon. I, I have to go back and do some research, because I, I want to understand, is this the first time? This is definitely not the first appearance of the Viper in this story in Spider-Woman. She had first appeared as Madame Hydra in a Captain America story. But what I don't understand is at what point she became involved with this demon, Cthon or something, C-H-T-H-O-N? I'm just not sure. I just, I don't know. So like I said, I'm, that's the stuff I'm reading. Let's see, I want to get back into Ikigami after I finish off this run of, of Black Hammer. And I think I have about four more issues to go. I think so. I think I have four more issues to go in that Black Hammer Library Edition. And then there's other stuff I want to read. I want to get back into Lazarus. I want to... And there's other stuff that I've bought, both physical copies and some things digitally. That I Oh, I have to finish off Batman and the Outsiders, that, that first collection of Batman and the Outsiders, which is the only one that I have at this point. Although I do have, like, the first 20 or 21 issues of the series. So I think that's about it for now. I think I'll hold off on talking about any cartoons I've been watching or anything sci-fi influenced. I've, I don't think I've been watching any sci-fi television other than cartoons, anime, and American cartoons. But That's it for episode 170. Dave Talks Comics can be found at davetalkscomics.com as well as the places where you usually find podcasts, such as Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, and places like that. You can always just try doing a Google search for Dave Talks Comics, and I think it will bring up my website or possibly a link to one of those websites. You can keep up with what I have currently been reading at davetalkscomics.net and what I have been watching at Small Screen Scrawls, Dot blogspot.com. I usually update those blogs on a daily or weekly basis. Links to small screen scrawls, in case you're not sure how that's spelled, can be found at davetalkscomics.com or davetalkscomics.net under the other blogs header on the right hand side of the page. Dot com for the cast, dot net for the notes. If you have comments or questions, I can be reached at davetalkscomics at gmail.com on Twitter, at Dave Talks Comics, or leave a, a comment on my website. I'm Dave. Thank you for listening. Quiet!